Hey everyone, welcome back to Better Biomed. Today I'm being joined by Tony from Capital I. He has a different style of business model and he chases a premier client and he uses premier talent. And in doing so, I wanted to bring him on. Let's, let's see how his business model works and let's see what he might be able to do for some of you guys because he has a really interesting scope for his business. He is expanding into realms that I think Biomed's just starting to touch on. So we'll get more on that in just a few minutes. But Tony, thank you so much for joining me. I do appreciate your taking your time. First off, uh, could, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Because you got a really interesting history as it is. Yeah, so so thanks, Justin. I appreciate you having me on. It's uh, you know, we've been we've been kind of discussing uh getting together uh for a long time and it's great to finally get together. Um we've had some great conversations at some of the expos and uh some of the events and uh, you know, really love what you're doing for the community and uh, getting the word out and and the good things, uh, just kind of education. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a lifelong learner and I love the education process and what you're doing for the field um, and just getting that that uh, the word out and and talking about what, what we can do and some options. And um, so, yeah, a little bit about myself and some background. So I uh, I joined the Army when I was 17. Uh, I was I was an infantryman. Uh, I decided I wanted to kind of jump out of planes and blow things up. Um, and then after a couple of years, I think the blowing things up uh, got old, so I wanted to make sure things didn't blow up. So I, I switched over to become a biomed because um, we all know that all medical devices run off of magic black smoke. Uh, and right. as soon as you let it out, it will not work <laughs> anymore. So um, so yeah, so you know, when I transitioned, uh, I went through the DoD BMET school in Shepherd. Um, I believe maybe what a couple of years before you did. Uh, so a very similar path. Yeah, I was in um, 2003. Yeah, so I, I went through in 99 and 2000. So okay, All right. right there. Um, yeah, and then, um, you, you know, started doing repair work as a bench tech um, at field hospitals. And then eventually, uh, you know, I deployed a couple times, um, went to Brook Army Medical Center, where I really cut my teeth on the, the really the technology end of the business. And um, the, the the leadership of larger teams, and managing um, you know, expectations with clinicians, because uh, that's what I found uh, more and more. To be a good biomed or, or to have a good program, you have to have that communication, that interaction with the clinicians. I mean, that that is hands down probably the best thing that any younger biomed could do is to make and build those relationships. Um, I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then from there, I, I transitioned to to become a warrant officer, where I could manage systems and teams. Uh, within the Army, uh, biomed community, HTM community. Um, hit on a couple different things. Again, a field hospital, combat support hospital. Um, and then uh, went back to BAMPC, did some things there for, for inventory management, asset management, which I, I take a lot of those principles with me now uh, because it, it, that's the one thing that I've noticed that the DOD does um, routinely and consistently better than the private sector is that asset accountability, the inventory management. Oh, yes. Um, and again, they have some special characteristics within the organization that they, allows them to do that, like, you know, uh, the Uniform Code of Military Justice and total financial liability. Uh, you yeah. know, you can't do that in the commercial market. So, um, but I learned a lot of principles from from that piece and I kind of took that forward with me. And then I spent a lot of time on the East Coast doing more strategic jobs. Um, in the army where I worked with the six MLMC. So we didn't do direct, you know, uh, biomed work for clinical care, clinical care. Uh, but it was more of that overarching support to a theater of operations, uh, did another deployment. And then I ended up working, um, for the office of surgeon general, two different times, uh, one in health facilities, planning, um, designing and building hospitals, um, Worked through a lot of initial outfitting and transition work. Uh, so the the adding of additional equipment and what does that look like? Uh, again, major com accountability component uh, for the inventory management. And then my final job, um, I worked over in as a, a HTM informatics and started working on systems. Um, yeah. GCSS Army integrating with the medical logistics system and, and medical maintenance. So those are some things that are still in flight. Um, but it's, it's not foreign to me to those challenges. And, you know, I was able to take that experience, um, whenever I talk to, you know, prospective clients about CMMS integration or, or a transition to a new CMMS. Um, so I got a lot of exposure in the army, um, and, and a lot of little things that I took away from each of my jobs throughout the 20 years, 
uh, to kind of shape and define um, this business and what we do here at Capital I. So that's that's really a bit about me professionally. Um, okay. Personally, I do have six kids, so I have a Brady Bunch. So my <laughs> wife brought in three. I brought in three. Okay. Um, yeah. So we all live live together, and uh, it's it's a big happy family. Now, you know, most of my kids are are adult children now, uh, okay. off in college. So it's just different experience. Uh, but I do have one that I that I sent off to the Air Force, and uh, this kind of talks to yeah. See, there you go. This kind of <laughs> talks to as well. Uh, he he wanted to be a biomed, uh, couldn't get biomed, nice. but. Uh, Second best thing, he is doing cybersecurity now. Um, so, and, and I think you kind of hit on that or tease that a little bit, because um, that's really one of the uh, kind of components and job skills and offerings uh, that we're looking to kind of do a mashup where you have those biomeds that also have a rich IT background. Um, right, right, obviously right. Obviously, cybersecurity, um, medical device integration with the EHR, um, all the automation, uh, as well as just monitoring a backbone. I mean, that's that's a huge part. So, so maybe when he's done with the Air Force, I can train him up as a biomed and, and steal his cyber uh, um, knowledge and, and that's build cool. on that. So yeah. now I I know that uh, well. You now you guys have a legacy, and and that's really <laughs> kind of a cool thing. Um, so the government does invest a lot of energy, a lot of time and money into uh, developing people like you with your leadership skills and your technical skills. Um, and I know that you, uh, Capital I, specializes in government contracts. Now, mm -hmm. what type of government contracts do you guys normally go after? Is is it like uh, VA hospitals or whatever? Um, what type What type of government contracts is it? Because most, most biomed companies really don't go after the federal sector, not that I know of. Yeah, yeah. So and that's one of the unique things too when we do go up to the federal sector. So, um, so we started doing with with staff augmentation work, um, and then most of the contractors. And, th and this was kind of my my complaint or or a thorn in my side when I was managing teams and contracts in the DoD is that we wouldn't have like an HTM or a biomed company that would provide that offering for augmented staff. It would just be a staffing company that just mm -hmm. hired a skill set didn't oh. really know or understand kind of um, the quality of a technician or the experience. Um, sometimes they would try to pass off folks that just didn't have uh, those certifications and credentials uh, to work right. on medical devices. It was just somebody that was general maintenance or general electronics, and they just tried to pass them off as BMEDs. Um, so we wanted to kind of shift that and make sure that, you know, and, and start this company to provide Qualified BMEDs, um, you know, this is a company that was founded and is currently run and managed and owned by former BMEDs and bench technicians. So we understand exactly. Go ahead. You had to. Uh... Well, yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm really kind of curious because when you're talking about like former biomeds, you and, and your business partner are military. So mm -hmm. I, I'm really kind of curious. How did you guys decide to start Capital I and. I think almost everybody's really kind of curious what's what's behind the name, man, because yeah, capital I and I is lowercase and it <laughs> it, it kind of like catches your eye and you're like, what is going on? Yeah, yeah. Everybody wants to know, you know, what does the I stand for? Um, and and do we do capital uh, investments and things like that? So really what, what capital I, the name came from um, one of the other co-founders and I, uh, we were we were in the army together. We deployed. Um, we were actually in the middle of Afghanistan and um it was it was right after the launch of the the iPad, yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> which everybody knew was going to be a terrible flop. Uh, if you look at some of the uh, the old news reports of when the iPad was launched, you know, it, it, everybody made fun of it. Um, right. And now it's it's part of everyday life. You know, you That's can right. do so many different things with it. I mean, I have one sitting over there. We use it for our inventory programs. Um, so you know, it, with that, it was like, man, everything coming out is 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 i this iPad, iPhone, iPod, i you know iTunes. Um, and we're like, you know, and, and again, these are just two soldiers stuck somewhere in Afghanistan waiting for a flight. We're like, you know, if we, if we start a biomed company, we'll just call it capital I. And then, and then because nobody uses a capital I anymore, everything's a lowercase I. <laughs> I said, so, but we'll, we'll keep the lowercase I, we'll just capital, put the capital in front of it. So th that's really where it came from is just uh, okay. two, two Joes, uh, you know, just joking around in, in the middle of Afghanistan. And then uh, when it came time to start the company, we didn't want to put in any more uh, time, effort, or energy to come up with something, uh, something cooler or clever. It's like, yeah, hey, it, it works, it sticks, and let's just run with it. So no, that, no, that's, that's where awesome, the name guys. came from. That's that's yeah. really cool. I yep. I, I know that uh, 
you guys are also a pretty big employer of, of veterans. I mean, you specifically said that you're looking for certain skill sets to fill, you know, a certain need. Um, tell me, tell me about that. What, what's it like trying to recruit veterans and like, like, because as a veteran, I, uh, my, my viewers know full well that I was one of these people that, um, I had a medical discharge and I had to drastically change my, my whole entire lifestyle. And it was really kind of a pain at the time back in 2012, finding somebody that would employ me and my skill set that understood. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's why I, I really appreciate you coming on and doing the show with me because, um, I'm, I'm a 120% uh, veteran supporter and you guys are as well. So tell me what it's like, uh, with, with veterans and what type of veterans are you guys looking for? Yeah. So, so when it comes to veterans and kind of interacting and, and, and employers, so, so when I, when I first left the military, um, and these are things that I learned as well along my journey. Um, and, and I started working with, um, well, I worked for Kaiser Permanente and to go into that, I had to retool the way I, I spoke and I talked because again, there's a lot of, of, of different, um, vernacular and it, just the way you speak when you're in the military about technical things, um, the way you would describe your jobs that you've had, it's mm -hmm. very military. And if if you go into an organization that does not have a strong military background, they they can't make that translation. Um, and so so I had to figure out that translation um, as I was in, you know entering the job market in a non military organization like Kaiser Permanente and a not for profit, um, and really kind of sell my experience and, and describe what I've done in their terms. Um, I was at a disadvantage because I didn't know what their terms were at the time, uh, but I kind of started to figure it out after after a while. And um, so that that's kind of the the, the tie when we recruit um, military and, and when military, you know, people that are leaving the military, they look at a, our company, there's that there's that instant kind of connection and, and credibility. It's like a credibility back and forth. I know what you've done. I know your training. I've know your experience, um, your drive to to serve, um, and then and then to complete the mission, and then they know that we understand that, so they don't have to translate. They can speak in that military speak. We understand exactly what they're saying. We know how to plug them into the right environments. There's some coaching along the way, but it's just that mutual respect back and forth with employer and prospective employee, um, where we have a, a, an understanding of where we've come from. Whereas if you know some other military folks as they're getting out, getting ready to get out. Uh, they have some interviews with companies that are non-military um, or even non-HTM or biomed, um, and and they're just talking past each other, or there's just not a, a level of comfort. Um, Interesting. So yeah, that's, are, are that's you, are you guys thing. a SkillBridge member? Are you a partner with the SkillBridge program? Yeah, so we're on the SkillBridge program, and then we also do so you, it, with with each individual. Uh, you can do a program kind of outside of SkillBridge, but it parallels okay. where you can point yourself directly to. A company and and, and um, there's some forms and some paperwork that you can fill out where it would be like the skill bridge program every all the things are just like it it's just that you don't leverage the platform to advertise okay. uh to say hey I'm, I'm out here looking for a job or you're looking for internships um we play matchmaker like right to uh the person uh, so we do have somebody on our team uh that he's an active duty uh cw4 um htm specialist in the army um, and he's just kind of working in the background. We're, we're exposing him to all of the kind of the intricacies of of running a company, um, you know, because that's that's a lot different from from what you see in the military. Uh, he knows how to run a shop. He knows how financials work in the army. But, you know, kind of, you know, lifting, open up the curtain to him to see what that back end of running a company looks like um, and how we generate business and how we you know, further develop our value proposition. Th those are the types of things that he's working on that, you know, you don't get exposed to that in the military. And then you need to be able to do that in a job, you know, kind of moving forward. Of course, we would love to retain him um, and, right. and you know, and, you know, have that mutual uh, uh, experience together. And, and he wants to stay with us and help us grow and, and we can help him grow. Um, but yes, yeah, so we, we are on SkillBridge. Uh, we do look for folks in the HTM background right, uh, right. with HTM background but we also look for you know supply technicians um, supply specialists um, automation system specialists because we do a lot of work with the DoD still so GCSS Army and cyber you know security. those systems and cybersecurity yeah. Yep. yeah so we still look for that and, and we're looking to grow that skill bridge program for those different skill sets as well well for the viewers um, 
we should probably tell you guys a little bit about what Skillbridge is. I, I don't mean to like jump over. A lot of the people that are watching this are not going to be military or prior military. But basically, there's a new program that came out, what, a year or two ago, something like that. Yeah. And, and when somebody is a transitioning military member, what happens is you go and you file a certain paperwork at the end of your tenure, the end of your career. And for six months, up to six months, uh, the military will pay your wages and your health care and your other fees while you transition into the civilian world, which is an amazing program. And so it gives you access to talent that otherwise you wouldn't have access to for free as a, mm -hmm. as a business owner. Meanwhile, you are giving somebody an opportunity to rebuild their life, which is it's amazing. And come from somebody that had to transition under duress uh, because I was having a medical issue and no, nobody was hiring me. You know, and I didn't know what the civilian side was. And there's clear discrepancy. There's a difference between the civilian life and how military biomeds do their job. And I would have really appreciated that. So I, I love when companies step out and they say, hey, we, we're here to help. And, um, you know, and, and if they do decide to stay on with the company, usually the companies hire them on if it's a good fit and you're good. Yep. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And and, and again, it's not just for uh, companies that have military ties. So it's in any company that's out there. That's right. Uh, it, and it's not even just for BMATs exclusively. It's it's for any type of company um, because we all know it, within DOD and the military services, um, it, they're running multinational, multi-billion dollar companies. Uh, and a lot of folks have a lot of experience that can be tapped into. Um, and like you said, it's 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 free labor. Uh, there's you know there's an educational component, mm -hmm. um, but it it allows you to you know almost risk free, um, put some time, effort, and energy into uh, a prospective employee or a soldier or airman that that's getting out of service and leveraging their skill set and and their their um, their thought process. I and mean, there's some thought diversity from a military member uh, that you might be able to bring onto your team. Um, so I right. think it's a, it's a great program. And you yourself, you have contracts like all over the country. You, like you're not in just one state. So yeah, yeah. tell us about that. Like, because I would imagine with your company, if somebody wanted to grow with your company and maybe move, let's say I'm in Texas now, not that I'm ever going to leave Texas, but <laughs> if, if I wanted to like transition with your company, maybe to a new opportunity, uh, companies like yours, they give that person that kind of flexibility but uh, tell us about some of your contracts and stuff. We we mentioned cybersecurity earlier. Haven't really touched on it yet, but yep. uh, I'd, I'd love to know more about uh, what's going on with some of your contracts. Yeah, so we have a couple of contracts um, where uh, within the VA, so it's the, the Biomed um, uh, BME, the Biomedical Equipment uh, Kind of Management Support Contract. And um, currently, I, th I think we're in 13 different facilities across the country. Uh, okay. Might even be a few more. And then with that, again, it's augmented staffing. Um, so there's just it, every it ranges from a general biomed to imaging biomed, and then that infosys biomed, where our, our team members are going into these VAs, they are configuring the medical devices in in conjunction with the EHR rollout, uh, which is Cerner, um, and kind of pointing those devices that are on the, that are network capable. And making sure that that integration occurs. So there's a lot of, of IT component, but then there's a, there's an opportunity to kind of grow from BMET one all the way up to BMET three, um, some imaging, um, and then if somebody does want to get into that networking side, get an A plus, S plus, S plus certification, um, we have positions that can leverage those certifications. Um, and we've had some team members that would would start off as a BMET one or two. Um, get those certifications and then transition to that Infosys BMED. And, and it's a it's a it's a pretty good jump in pay uh, just because that skill set is so sought sought after. Um and and again, you know, we've we've transitioned folks from Alabama to Florida or from Oklahoma to to North Dakota. You know, so we're we're in a lot of different locations just on the VA. And then we have some several different sites on the DOD side um, from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, California, Utah. And we do have some folks that kind of traverse those opportunities and positions, um, take a look at that. And then we also have employees that know, hey, you know, we're, we're a growing company. Let me know whenever you have work in Texas, for example, because mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to move back to Texas and, and, <laughs> and stay with the company. You know, it's, it seems like folks want to stay with the company um, more than they just want to move to a state, but we afford the opportunity for both. 
Um, and it's, it's really great to get out there and, and talk to the technicians and the BMETs and um, kind of hear what they're doing, what their thoughts are. And then we, we make strategic business decisions based on kind of the feedback from the bench techs and the folks that are out there uh, doing the work. Um, and, and you're right, that, that geographic permeability and be able to go from, from location to location under the same company, um, it's, it's a good sell uh, to prospective employees and talent. And as we grow, you know, we want to keep that talent pool um, internally. But, you know, if, if somebody does want to move on and we, we have no problem at all developing talent to make sure that the, the field is better in the future, wherever they're employed. Um, and that's the other kind of focus and perspective that we have. You know, we don't want you to be afraid to um, look for other opportunities, um, even leveraging our training and, and the experience that you gain from us to go get other opportunities, because then that's we're just continuing to build our network. Um, so we, we, we encourage that. We want people to grow. We don't want people to stay st stagnant and stay in one place just because we selfishly, uh, okay. want to profit off of them. Right. So it's like right. the, the growth is a big deal. All right. That, and that's a pretty good point. I mean, we're a small career field and the chance that you're either going to work with or for one of these people in the future is really good. It's really mm -hmm. good. Now, I, I don't want to have the misconception, everyone, that like you're uh, a military and government owned uh, type of company because you guys actually do a lot of civilian type of contracts and stuff. And as you grow, I mean, those are all, you know, there's sky's the limit when it comes to civilian type of uh, work. But with, with especially with cybersecurity, I, I'm kind of curious about that because that is a new type of thing. When I, when I said in the intro that you are getting into stuff that most other people aren't kind of getting into. And I, I find that fascinating as a business owner, you decide this unique business model and then you attach cybersecurity too, which is a hotbed right now. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about the FDA and, you know, cybersecurity? It's a real, it's a real issue this year. So I, I'd be curious since that's, that's part of, you know, your core of what you guys do. What do you think about cybersecurity and, and the next year or two? Yeah. So, so, so there's a couple of things at play for our cybersecurity kind of strategy um, so, you know, I mentioned earlier when I left the military and I joined Kaiser Permanente um, and I was, I was a, dire a regional director. And, and one of the first things that we were hit with was the WannaCry virus. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sure everybody remembers that uh, from 2017. Um, and and it was all hands. It was very manual. It was like a brute force kind of reaction um, to support this uh, because there's there's a lot of nuance to cybersecurity Um uh, risk mitigation for medical devices. Uh, so you can't use those larger kind of one size fits all tools that you can for PCs and servers, um, just because there, there's there's a, a huge potential for a negative patient interaction um, if you're just pushing patches or updates right. uh, to, to medical devices without really understanding what that impact would be to the clinical delivery. Um, so, so you had to be very slow, very deliberate. Um, so one of the things that I did was I, I knew that um, within the company, we didn't have a strong background in IT, IT services, cybersecurity. Um, so so I we went after some talent. So our CIO uh, has no medical background. He has no um, HTM background. Uh, he actually was in manufacturing and banking IT. Um, so in IT project management, um, did some, some kind of managing of, of teams, a lot of cybersecurity backgrounds so is okay. This is our guy. Um, so Matt, who's our CIO, um, really kind of shepherded us through that process, kind of build out what it would need to look like. Uh, and, and there were some things that translated and, and some similarities where he's working in manufacturing and assembly lines, um, and, and those processes where cybersecurity was, was, you know, important to the bottom line. Uh, but he instantly understood uh, what that would look like for patient care, patient safety. He he, he got it. Um, and he was able to kind of really shepherd us through that process and, and start to look at different ways to integrate our skill sets, um, folks that can, you know, transactionally manage a device and and ensure that it was secure. And then that overall prog prog programmatic approach to monitoring, measuring, um, observing, you know, the cybersecurity components of, of an organization. Um, and then, you know, we, we've looked at some different tools that are out there. Um, you know, 
Uh, I think there's, you know, order, scenario, oh, yeah. or scout, right? A lot of these monitoring systems that you can leverage and manage. Um, and what we're finding out is, is you need somebody that has an HTM background with an understanding of cybersecurity to manage those programs and, and to, to leverage. You can't just kind of buy that, plug it in and put it on autopilot. There's, there has to be some management and, and that's, that's really one of the, yeah, that's one of the, um, the areas that we looked at as far as an offering and a core competency. Um, and really, uh, you know, we owe a lot to, to Matt, Matt Garthwaite, um, who's our CIO. We even spun off another company um, called Straight Line Tech. Okay. And they do IT managed services. So oh, it's right. kind of really in his wheelhouse. Um, and then the beauty of Capital I owning that company is that when we start looking at, um, you know, uh, automation and data optimization and kind of workflow optimization, you know, he specializes in, in, in those types of things and his company does. Um, so we just get to tap right into that. And as we kind of go into different programs, we can we can take a look at workflows and automations and dashboards. Um, it's like we have a wizard behind us. So that, okay. that's the other piece is, is being willing to partner with somebody outside the HTM field that is an expert in their field uh, where we cross paths. And, and um, I think it was one of the one of the best decisions we made as a company to, to kind of invest in that and, and bring him on. Um, and he does have an ownership stake now in the company. Nice. So it's, it's great working with him. Well, you guys are already bridging a gap that I've been talking about for a long time because you, you're probably well aware that a lot of biomeds are very hesitant on biomed getting closer to IT. And I think at this point, it's undeniable. I mean, it's this is happening. And mm -hmm. you know now they're really pushing cybersecurity this year. Um, you know, we've heard about AI and anybody that's used like AI, it can make your life much, much easier with predictability and stuff. Um, I'm also a little bit curious, do you guys do like consultant work? Because, um, you know, you guys are touching on a lot of stuff that a lot of biomeds have no idea about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we do have a consulting op, uh, you know, um, kind of option or program, um, you know, we're, we're starting to brand that out as, as a, like an HTM modernization um, to go in. And, and, and a lot of it starts with policies and procedures. What do mm -hmm. your policies and procedures look like? And then not only yours with an HTM, what do the, the IT policies and procedures look like? So to, to kind of scour through that and understand what your organization does as an IT organization, and then, and then how you can plug in leverage or even make that better um, but, you know, to find those connections, define devices for IT, um, define IT devices for, for HTM, uh, because they're, they're, you know, what, where, where is that line of, uh, you know, demarcation? Where does IT begin, medical equipment end? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and like you said, it's, it's blurred quite a bit. So we do have subject matter experts that can step in. Um, and that's really where we start with that policy management, policy review, look at the different procedures. Um, and then look at the, the organization's challenges, goals, timelines, budgets, right? Those are all things that drive different projects and how you can modernize um, and help shape what that program could look like. And then and then participate in that process and have some of our experts, um, like I said, from the Skillbridge program, where we have these DOD leaders that can take large, complex programs and shepherd um, organizations through the process, uh, those, and those organizational leaders through the process. So that's, that's what our consulting effort looks like, um, on the cyber side. And of course, just general biomed, um, and, and shop management, uh, program management, you know, accreditation readiness. Um, how do you make sure that the joint commission doesn't come up and get you? Um, so it's constantly kind of keeping up with that because it's a, it's a, it's an ever-changing world, uh, more, more so now, um, than in the past. And, and, our HTM leaders and kind of consultants can step in and do those types of, of programs. Now, you you mentioned a couple of things here that um, things I never thought to do myself. And that's why I'm taking some notes because, uh, you know, at, when you talk to somebody that really knows what they're doing, you figure out your deficiencies. And you were talking about um, reading through your plan. And one of the things I always suggest to people is to always go through your medical equipment management plan, right? It's the first thing you should do when you show up at a site, whether or not you're a leader, even if you're just a worker bee, right? Right. I never thought to go through the IT management plan. And they definitely mm -hmm. have one. They have to. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, that. how many senior level biomeds, even uh, medical equipment networking specialists, how many people have ever seen the IT management plan? I've never thought to even do that. So, 
Um, now I, I could see where there would be some, some big problems. Obviously that's also where you're going to dictate where biomed's responsibility ends and IT's begins. It, it should mm -hmm. be part of the plan, right? Right. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, so you can help you influence that too. You know, I talked earlier about relationships with, with clinicians, right? It's, it's relationships with the IT professionals as well, whether it be, uh, you know, someone from the help desk that can help you out with in a pinch that you can, you know, you have a go-to person. Mm -hmm. um, or the IT leadership where you start talking about policy and strategy and 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 this those different types of things. Those relationships are are crucial now. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree because now uh, when something does happen, like if, if there's a deficiency in your IT network, it could creep into your biomed network very quickly. And I mean, you're t it's not the world anymore where you're talking one patient room that's down. You could actually mm -hmm. take down a whole section of a hospital or even a network. I mean, it's, it's really wild when you think about that, but mm -hmm. you guys do offer consultancy, which I would say is a big plus because with my experience of going around and visiting biomed shops and stuff, a lot of them are not ready. I mean, programs like Order and uh, a, a few of the others that you mentioned, they're helping because, you know, the hard part is gathering the data, right? And that will gather data, but then what do you do with it? Because most shops don't employ an HTM expert to manage those type of, of programs. They they usually get some IT guy or, you know, the program is abandoned. There's there's no annual um, budget that's established for maintaining it. I mean, I've, I've seen a little bit of everything. Um, and that's that's almost sad, but mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're, as an industry, we're working on it. And that's why I'm really glad that people are already being proactive because I don't know of any other company that's offering those kind of services uh, to help you know, uh, medical facilities, not, not just the big ones, but also the little ones. Uh, I mean, they're, they're just as susceptible to, uh, you yeah. know, uh, if, it, if not more, um, that's awesome. Now I, I, I really want to kind of change gears a little bit because you're an employer and you're an employer that's growing. So can, can you tell me, uh, not just military people, I know that you employ a variety of different talent. What, what do you look for in an employer, a candidate? Yeah, so the, the first thing that we look for um, is, is somebody that's a problem solver. They can demonstrate that they know how to solve problems. Um, it, that's one of the biggest skills that you can have is, is you, you've learned how to learn. You can take a problem and you can independently solve that problem. Uh, whether it be an IT glitch um, with if we're doing like a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting um, and, and we, we want to have face to face, if if you can't figure out how to solve that problem on your end, that's a red flag. Um, you know, some little things like that, um, and then and then how you 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 market yourself, right? So when when an employer is looking for an employee, and when we're looking for employees, we're we're making sure that you know these folks are confident um, in their skill set. They they really are hungry to learn um, to pr solve problems to to grow themselves um, within the career. So so I look for prospective employees that ask questions back. Um, you know, you're going to have those typical um, interviews where me on the employee, employee or employer side, I'm asking about you, you know, tell me about your background, tell me about your education, tell me about your training, tell me about your experience. Um, okay. so I'm drawing that out. Um, and I try to shape that in the, in, in the, the form of a story, you know, tell me, tell me about a time when you did this, or what would someone else say about you? Um, you know, and I, and I try to draw that honesty out from different candidates. Um, so I have a way of kind of forcing through it. There's a couple different books by Patrick Lincioni that talks about, you know, the ideal team player. Um, so for any other managers or hiring managers out there, I, I would really subscribe to some Patrick Lincioni material um, to find the best candidates and team players. Um, and then, you know, really what I'm looking for, too, is is how inquisitive is the candidate, um, how, how are they going to challenge me? One of the best questions that I ever get is, you know, what does success look like for me if I join your organization? Mm. Um, you know, okay. and, and kind of talk through that. Um, so that's really what we're looking looking for um, in that interpersonal level. Obviously, the skill sets, uh, the training, you know, those are more table stakes. Um, you, you know, you have to have uh, an associate's degree in, in biomedical engineering or technology um, to be able to touch a lot of our equipment. And then, it, you know, our, our commercial or sorry, our federal contracts require 
at a minimum that you have one of three things, either an associate's degree in, in biomed, um, uh, DOD trained bi biomed, mm -hmm. or you have an AME certification, uh, CBET, okay. CRES. Um, so, you know, you can, you can attain an AME certification without those other two, um, educational sources. Um, it's, it's very, it's difficult. Um, but we do recognize that if they've gone through that gauntlet of experience and training, um, you know, receive that AME certification, we recognize and the DOD even recognizes that, that you're a qualified technician to work on medical devices. Wow. Okay. So, so I said a lot there. I hope that, that kind no, of, no, no, that's, answered that's that. interesting. Uh, I, I never even considered that. Um, the fact that you yourself have limitations as an employer because of the type of contracts that you're seeking. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting. Now you've been a biomed longer than me. I know uh, you also were a biomed back during the war. Um, I know you probably have some crazy stories from back there. I mean, because now you're you're an executive of a company and and now you run the show. But what was it like when when you got started as a biomed? Because part of what develops us as as leaders is what you had to endure when you were a junior level. So, mm -hmm. what was it like for you as a junior level? And and what would you do differently if you could? Yeah, so so I had two different phases when I was a biomed. Um, so I had the pre-war, pre-9-11 biomed time yeah, all um, right. where, where there was no money. Uh, there were no resources or assets, uh, uh, you know, um, you, you know, and, and we just I, that's where I really learned how to uh, tinker and just work on things because just kind of jump in. Um, you know, repair parts weren't flowing. Uh, so, so in my shop at Fort Polk, Louisiana, you know, I had a lot of stuff that was mid repair, um, just because I couldn't get repair parts. It just, there wasn't, there weren't funds. Um, nobody ever thought we would go to to war with that stuff. Um, <laughs> so it was just like, yeah, you know, you just do it. But so I became a tinkerer, um, really kind of learning the, the mechanics and, and the, you know, different types of troubleshooting all the way, still component level troubleshooting then. Um, and kind of working through and understanding just the, the, the shop management, all the forms to fill out the, the, the old systems, yeah. you know, that we had to do, uh, I mean, we didn't even have an internet at the time, uh, in my shop. So just think about that. That's the difference of when I started and then, uh, you know, post nine 11, um, yeah, things changed quite a bit. Um, so readiness kind of ramped up, um, the war effort ramped up. So you started getting newer equipment issued out. Um, that's when we kind of transitioned and started to field, um, digital radiology, uh, radiography uh, at that oh, yeah. time. Um, yeah, yeah. so like the Oryx and the Campano and, you know, kind of those plate readers. Yeah. Uh, so I got trained on that stuff. Um, so the, I really saw, the military start to invest more and more into higher tech um, medical devices. And, and then they invested in the training of the BMEDs. So I, I was a recipient of that. Um, so I was kind of fortunate that the war happened because I, my, my understanding and my technical expertise really exploded because it, it had to, because we didn't have technicians that had a higher level of expertise with this new equipment that coming out to support the war effort. Um, and then during deployment, um, you know, it, it, the budget wasn't an issue, but the supply chain was. Um, so it was, you know, it's a matter of getting things to you, um, requesting and, and leveraging systems and, and kind of working through those complex issues like a lack of communication or <laughs> the inability to communicate. Um, you know, there were times where, uh, you know, I, I would be rebuilding sterilizers uh, on the fly, um, you know, outside in the heat uh, in, in northern Kuwait. Um to kind of support the the OR and the CMS um, and things like that. You know, as far as any kind of the crazier stories, I mean, everybody has like their, their crazy stories. I mean, I was never, you know, uh, mortared or, or shot at directly or anything crazy. I didn't have to fire my weapon, you know, and it's, it's, it's <laughs> interesting too, to kind of talk to folks that aren't in the military and they don't realize that if you're, if you're a biomed in the military, you do biomed stuff. You're not, you know, when you go to war, you go to war as a biomed. You do, you're right. doing biomed things. You're not a trigger yeah. puller. You're not flying a jet. Um, you know, so <laughs> so you know, for everybody to understand that the the machine behind everything um, within within you know a, a forward employed or forward deployed environment, um, you have all those support staff uh, right. kind of working through that. And that's one of the things. Um, so I ended up becoming a platoon sergeant. 
a maintenance platoon sergeant. So we had rolling stock. Um, I had the biomed shop as well. Um, and one of the things that I kept reminding people was like, what you're doing, you know, you know we don't have to be in the fight um, to be a part of the fight. Uh, so, you know, and that's one of the things too, that e even on the corporate side, you know, don't judge your impact on the fight based on your proximity to the fight. Um, mm -hmm. You can provide a major impact, um, you know, with the gear in the rear, uh, but do your job mm -hmm. well, support that person that's in the front line, support that BMET that's, you know, interacting with a clinician or dealing with somebody that uh, has a piece of equipment that goes down and they're frustrated because they have a patient on the other end. That's right. Um, so, you know, so, so really the, my experience from that is, is, is I felt that I was an enabler. Um, so, so, you know, the true warriors that went out there, they had confidence that if something happened to them, that they were going to get world-class medical care and the devices were not going to fail. Um, right. That that was my mindset and kind of my mission was to ensure that 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 war fighter, that front line person had that confidence of the support behind him or her. Right. Now, I, I'm kind of curious because uh, Capital I is not that old of a company. And uh, you started this company as soon as you got out of the military, right? Uh, it was about, about two years after I got out of the military. So I, okay. I started with Kaiser Permanente um, right. and, and and I wanted to get that commercial experience. I thought I was just going to grow with them, but um, driving the traffic in the Beltway in DC, um, it, it, it beat me down. Um, yeah, that's so like I, the worst so traffic I, in the country. <laughs> what yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I was doing, you know, halfway around the Beltway every day. Um, wow. And so, uh, so yeah, so then, so, so we I moved my family to Missouri, uh, Southwest Missouri. So my wife has some family ties out here. Um, and that enabled me to, to really start the company. So I, I resigned from my position at Kaiser Permanente. Um, fortunately by moving from DC, the DC area to Southwest Missouri, my cost of living got slashed in half. Yeah. Um, and I was able to kind of absorb the, the growth of a company. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of funny to see, my earnings drop off to, to zero, um, it, you know, when you start a company and you, you jump in. I mean, that's one of the things, there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there that want to start a company, but mm -hmm. don't have the stomach or, or aren't in the position to earn zero. Um, oh, the I first, agree. You know, six, nine months, a year, um, you know, when you start a company. Uh, I, you know, so, I, I tell people that all the time in my other videos is that, um, one of the things that you should always do is be financially responsible because then you have options. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, people that are just completely strapped with debt, they, they don't have options. So, I mean, especially you military members that are thinking about transitioning, whether or not there's a skill bridge program or not, it doesn't even matter. Limit your debts like years yeah. before you decide to get out. And um, yeah, I would say that's one of the biggest things that also traps the entrepreneurs is uh, mm -hmm. you know, they incur debts too quickly uh, and that they, aren't prepared to limit their own living expenses. So that's interesting. What what advice would you give to somebody that wants to start their own biomed company? Because I mean, there's there's a lot of people that have come to me and they've, they've been asking me about it and they're, you know, I don't know, I, I don't have a biomed company, you tell me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so so I would encourage folks that wanna go down that path to, to educate themselves enough to just get started. So if you, if you okay. wanna start a biomed company, you, you start with yourself as the billable. Um, so when we, I'll, I'll just talk through my journey um, and, and with my business partners. So what we did was um, we started doing just kind of consulting work back to the DOD um, that was, you know, as a, as a subcontractor, so we could build the company up. Um, so, so I was the, the talent, the workforce and kind of the, the revenue generation, as well as building the structure of the company and, and going through the administrative burden of, of running and managing the company. It's a lot easier when it's just you and, and it's just one person you have to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, but there are things that you have to do. Um, so get smart on, um, you know, registering with the, the company with a state um, right. and the taxes and the banking, um, accounting, uh, those are, those are all the things or, or the reasons why companies fail. Um, companies don't typically fail because they're not good at their core competency. Companies typically fail because they're not good at running a company. Hmm. Um, so I would say, you know, get some education and understanding of how, how a business needs to run, uh, at, at a very low level. I'm not saying right. you have to be a it's multinational 
freaking tycoon to run a biomed company. But but again, it'll bite you in the in the in the behind if if you um, don't understand how a business needs to be run and just at, at, a, right. at a surface level um, and then be prepared to, to work um, many hours to get out there and say yes to things that you probably wouldn't say yes to. Um, <laughs> you know, initially it's like anybody that's offering any kind of money for any service. Yep. I do that. Um, <laughs> and then you figure out how to do it. Right. Uh, and then, and then, you know, and then as you slowly grow, if you want to grow into something just bigger than yourself, you would, you would want to invest in different things, different tools, uh, whether it be it tools and systems or, um, physical tools, TMD test equipment, um, right. And just slowly and incrementally work your way up. Um, and then with the running of the business, as it gets bigger, there are, there are other requirements that'll add on to it. Uh, but just be prepared for constant building blocks. Um, so don't look at a company like my company or, or even a larger publicly traded company thinking like, oh, I got to have a full HR system. I have, right. have to have a full. You don't need to start with that. You can start incrementally and slowly and it, and it builds into that. Um you know, so and then and then surround yourself with good people like I did. Um, you know, my COO, uh, he and I got, were in the military together. Um, I overpromise things, and he figures out how to deliver. Right, that that's wow. the relationship that we have. Um, wow. You know, okay. Um, and then you look, you know, and then I, my CFO, I went to business school with him, took him from the banking sector. So you know that helps us. So I don't have to worry about the financial side anymore. Uh, and then we talked earlier about the, um, you know, that cybersecurity. And, you know, when I re went out and got my, our CIO, um, it was the same thing. I wanted to look for talent that can 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 augment and, and supplement me and fill in where I have shortcomings. Uh, and I'm not going to learn everything about cybersecurity, but I don't need to now. I have him. Um, so if, if you want to grow, surround yourself with good people. Um, right. Don't say no to anybody that's willing to pay you to do anything. Um, <laughs> and, and, and small incremental uh, steps to, of growth. Right. Well, I, you know, and also, um, see, Tony is also an active member on social media as well. So one of the things that anybody is maybe thinking about starting their own company, um, you should add them to your LinkedIn network, just like you should be adding me to your LinkedIn network. Whenever you talk to somebody or whenever you hear somebody that's got some really good information, follow them and follow their posts because they'll usually like tell you about opportunities that are coming up or they'll, they'll throw out tidbits of advice follow people that are on the right path. And like you said, surround yourself with successful people, which also means on social media. So, uh, and we're a community, like we work together. Like I've already uh, looked at some possibilities for uh, working with Capital I as a business. And um, if you're looking for a job, we're gonna be doing some uh, regular uh, read-offs of jobs, you know, uh, because we wanna get these opportunities out to the public as quickly as possible so that we can fulfill these contracts, get people jobs, most importantly, and uh, maybe even get them uh, the lifestyle that they've always wanted. Maybe you wanted to move to Minnesota or Washington DC or something like that. Well, there's gonna be some opportunities. Follow us on social media and we are going to be posting those openly. And uh, I'll, I'll be sharing posts and stuff from these guys uh, whenever they can. But um, Tony, one, one last thing. What's, what do you see for the future of your company? Because your company is not that old, but it's been growing really quickly. So, what do you see for the future? Yeah, we, we've we've realized some some pretty significant growth. So, uh, we st we started in 2018, didn't really hit the revenue phase until 2019, um, and uh, just a couple months ago, we were recognized by um, the Inc. Regionals. So, Inc.com were the Inc. Regionals Midwest um, third fastest growing company in the in the in the country or in the in the Midwest. Um, so with, with that level of growth, um, you know, it's, it's preparedness meets opportunity equals success, right? It's just, it's just right. that. So, so having those incremental steps kind of building out, really getting in tune with what the, the market needs, um, and being prepared to provide a solution for that market need, um, is 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 was key to our success. Um, so one of one of the things that really helped us grow and and you know outside of the DoD work on the commercial side is that we wanted to look at data and 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 help HTM organizations clean up their data so mm -hmm. they could do some really good reporting dashboarding 
Um, and and what drove us to that was in response to to the the COVID nineteen pandemic, where people didn't know or where their ventilators were, where their BiPAPs were, because they were labeled incorrectly in their CMMS, um, and and they couldn't get the reporting. So we would go through and we would we would normalize that data to make reporting easier, to make capital investment decisions easier. Right? That was a, that wasn't something that we thought about when we wanted to provide a BMET staffing and an HTM support. It's like okay, so this is a huge component of it, um, and really learning what the industry needs. And building a plan and a program and 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 kind of springboarding off of those successes, you can start small with a small clinic. Say, hey, I'll clean up your data, um, yeah. you know, do it cheaply, uh, and then and then springboard off of that success. Um, so you know that was probably a key to our success. Um, the willingness to grind it out, uh, you know, myself, my COO, um, many many late hours. Um, kind of figuring things out. You know, we we always kind of joke like, you know, we're sitting in recliners. We got a, a basketball game on in the background or whatever. We have our laptops out. It's like, you know, if, if people realize that this is what it takes to to run a company and grow a company, <laughs> like they they wouldn't think They'd we're serious people uh, or yeah. they would never do it. Right. Um, but there are a lot of decisions made on the fly. Um, hmm. And and that don't be afraid to make a decision. You know, we're not afraid to to invest in and in kind of take on risky clients or, or kind of risky business propositions um yeah. because we, we're prepared enough and we have the right resources to where we believe that we'll we'll be successful um and then as far as future growth it's it's really uh, on the commercial sector um becoming uh an independent service organization um you know managing uh, an entire outsource program as opposed to just augmenting the staff right. or even helping programs that are outsourced help them insource um hmm. so with with those that htm modernization there maybe there's there's a there's a better way or more efficient way to insource programs and and we want to provide those assistance so we're not just um an iso that's looking to take over all of your programs um we, we we're on the other side of the coin too where we want your program to be as efficient um and as successful as possible and i think by having all of those offerings um that's a key to our growth um and, and kind of makes us appealing to some of our clients. I would uh, definitely agree, guys. Um, as I said earlier, we're going to follow Tony on social media, Tony Danko. Uh, I'll leave his information in the video description below, along with uh, the link to Capital I, because uh, they're, they're constantly updating their contracts and stuff. It's one of those things where they're not just employer. They're also, if, if you have a problem, reach out to them. Because, I mean, you've got a lot of experience here and people that have a lot of connections and doing so, uh, maybe they can help you solve your problem, whether it's outsourcing a part of your program or uh, maybe even uh, consultancy. You know, it's you never know. Uh, reach out to him and see what he can do for you. Tony, thank you so much for your time, man. I, I do appreciate this. This was pretty informative. I've got a book full of notes here because as you're talking, I'm like, wow, this is stuff I, I have to do more research just when I go home because uh, uh some of the stuff i've learned from you but um I, I again thank you for your time man and uh yeah guys if you need anything reach out to tony and myself um he's he's been more than open when it comes to answer my questions and stuff which is why he's on the program today so tony thank you so much man thank you justin and keep doing what you're doing um uh, again like i said i can't say enough about about the the you know the influence that you're having so really really oh, cool you. stuff i yep, appreciate thank it. you again All right, guys. Thanks again.